said. He Perfect. Said that. Okay. Because it failed. Okay. So, hi, my name is Caitlin. Um, I'm a grad student in microbiology and immunology. And today I'm going to talk about uh, synthetic biology, which is a new and emerging field and kind of combines uh, both programming and biology. It's something I'm really interested in. So, I like this little comic because I feel like this kid sometimes kind of imagine what might be possible if bacteria were working for us. And so, I'm going to start out by talking a little bit about biology first, then tell you about one little kind of hack I did, and then uh, talk about kind of the trends in the field. So first, um, a great friend of mine from undergrad always says, your body is made of tiny machines that are controlled by many other tiny robots. And if you think about it, it's true. You're made of trillions of cells that are controlled by trillions of proteins. And each of your cells in your body is incredibly efficient and highly specific. So a neuron knows to be a neuron, a cardiac cell knows to be a cardiac cell. The code, of course, is, is contained within the DNA, so that tells all of the robots what to do. And one of our, pro our huge problems is that we don't fully understand the full program yet. <coughs> so many of you have taken high school biology, you're probably familiar with the central dogma, but basically all the information in the genetic code is stored as DNA, which is made up of four base pairs, uh, chemical base pairs shown here. And then through a process known as transcription that gets transcribed into messenger RNA, which is made up of uh, three of the same base pairs as DNA, as well as uracil. And then finally, uh, that mRNA gets translated into protein uh, via this codon table here. So if you have three U's in a row, you'll get either a phenylalanine uh, or a leucine. And then these proteins are the robots. <coughs> and so you can imagine there's a lot that you can do to engineer them to do um, really anything you want. And so again, um, we start out with a genetic code just a string of A's, T's, C's, and G's. Then our RNA polymerase comes in and it takes the DNA and creates new RNA from the DNA, which is pretty cool, through transcription. And then the second process is translation, where you have a giant protein taking in the mRNA and spitting out um, a polypeptide chain of amino acids. So again, that's just the basic background of how it works. We can tell these cells what to do by manipulating the code and manipulating the protein. So we can make mutations, we can knock out genes, um, we can make insertions, we can insert genes, as well as we can direct the expression of certain genes. So we can say, only turn on at high temperature, only turn off at low temperature. Bacteria are much easier to program than human cells, and I'll say why in a second. Um, and this is a quote from one of my high school, prof or, excuse me, college professors. He says, E. coli are great workers, we don't have to pay them much, and they never try to unionize. And it's true. Um, they're really simple to grow. Uh, the doubling time is every 20 minutes. So one of the reasons that um, it's really easy to work with bacteria is because they only have one circular chromosome, whereas in a human cell, we have 46. So it's really hard to predict what's going to go wrong, what's going to happen with a human cell. So now I'd like to talk about really quick something that I did. So one of my questions in my research was, when is the transcription of a particular gene turned on? Is it turned on at a certain growth phase? Is it turned on under bleach treatment or whatever? So um, what I decided to do was engineer a fluorescent recorder so that I could expose my bacteria to different treatments and then determine when the gene was being transcribed by looking for color. So first, all genes have small promoter regions that contain this conserved sequence of DNA base pairs. So this is my gene of interest here. And it doesn't really matter what it does. In fact, I don't even know what it does. Um, and so the promoter is really important because that's where our friend RNA polymerase is going to recognize and bind and then direct transcription through the gene. What I decided to do was to take that promoter and clone it into a plasmid, which is a small piece of DNA, uh, circular DNA that you can give to bacteria. What I did, though, was clone it in right in front of a green fluorescent protein. And so this is um, a protein that we know. We know the sequence, we know how it works, and we can use it for tools. So by cloning in that promoter then, any time RNA polymerase was turning on the gene on the chromosome, it would also be binding to the same promoter on the plasma. And then you could get um, green colonies of bacteria. And that's what I got. So I was pretty excited. This is, just, um, this is just a microscope picture of a bunch of my bacteria. So I work on this bacteria called Legionella. And um, some of them are really stringy, but you can see some of these long guys are really bright. And so there's some sort of growth phase in which these ones are really transcribing that gene. So that's just a, kind of a proof of concept. Um, but in the field, um, that's, that's practically child's play. It's so easy. And so um, what's being developed now are these genetic toggle switches. So these are gene circuits, essentially. 
And how they work is you have two states, state one and state two, and you have a promoter directing expression of a repressor for state two, and a promoter two directing expression of a repressor for state one. And then you can add in chemical or, uh, as I mentioned, temperature inducers um, to relieve the repression. So for instance, if we want to turn on promoter one, we add the inducer and that blocks the repressor from binding to it. So it's a really tightly controlled, very nice by state to state. And this was first discovered um, and designed in uh, 2000, and that was kind of the beginning of the synthetic biology era. Ten years later, they kind of finally got to a point where they could take it all together and engineer a microbial kill switch. And so this is the genetics up here, and it doesn't really matter, but the point that I want to make is that it functions as the way that, I, uh, analogous to the switch I just showed you, there are two inputs and two repressors. And what they did was engineer a way that you could direct bacteria to kill themselves. And so this assay is a measure of bacterial killing. Again, it's not really important to know the details, but um, they have an untreated, a strain with a component one, a strain with component two, and then the only time they get cell death, this is a measure of cell death, is when you have uh, both components. And you can see that in the microscope images over time after they add a inducer, the amount of bacteria goes down. So I think that's pretty sweet, and it has a lot of implications. So you can have um, bacteria go into your stomach and deliver a drug and then kill themselves so they won't, they won't cause any other problems with your immune system. There are a lot of functions for this. Additionally, a couple years later, um, the same group designed uh, an entire circuit board, so a whole series of circuits that they can turn on and off to do different things. And in this case, they control the entire um, four different metabolic pathways in E. coli, which is really no small feat because there are over a million genes. And so that was really cool. Um, again, you don't need to know the details, but to know that it's possible. So these are really good for turning on, these circuits are really good for turning on genes or directing expression of proteins and affecting things on a cell level. But what if you want to affect things on a population-based level? And to do that, one of the tools we have are phages. And so phages are viruses that infect bacteria. And what they are are just incredibly small little pieces of protein that have a capsid region that holds all the DNA and that has this sheath and then tail fiber. And these are important because these viruses literally dock on to the bacterial cell membrane and inject the DNA, which is pretty wild. And so um, what a lot of groups are working on now is designing phages that can target multi-species or multiple different kinds of bacteria um, to do different things, so across space and time. And so one cool example is biofilms. So some of you might know about biofilms. First of all, you all have them on your teeth right now um, because of what you've been eating. As well as, um, if people go to the hospital and get an implanted hip or a pacemaker or so on, one of the huge issues is that, um, if I, you know, inevitably some bacteria get on those devices. And then when they get in your body, they can grow and form biofilms over them, and that can be a serious issue, especially for someone who's already immunocompromised from being under surgery. So um, one thing this group is doing is using phage to destroy biofilms. So I'll start on this side. A biofilm is basically just a pile of different kinds of bacteria all sticking together. Um, they're very resistant to bleach and to ethanol and all those sorts of things you would normally think to kill off bacteria with. But by using this phage, they program in a little bit of DNA that will tell the cells uh, to kill themselves. So they'll go in and they'll infect. Uh, then the phage will replicate and start expressing the protein that's required for killing. And then that will allow for lysis of the cells and then reinfection uh, via the phage. So I think that's pretty neat. All you need to clear, to clear, say, waterways or to clear, um, you could use this as kind of a topical, so to wipe down pacemaker or sterilize, you know, a hip or something like that, um, because these infections truly are tissue. So using these tools, you can start to think of all sorts of crazy possibilities. So obviously the first thing you can think about is biofuels or um, engineering ethanol production. Um, you can engineer an entire microbiome. So the microbiome is the full collection of all the bacteria in your body. So some of you guys might not know that uh, by genome weight, you are 90% microbial, 90% not human, which is kind of why. So um, you can, and what they've actually started to do is engineer different gut microbiomes for people who have inflammatory bowel disease. So that can be completely reversed by just giving them a whole new population of bacteria. It's wild. Likewise, um, there have been trials using lactobacillus, which is just a, um, a kind of non-pathogenic bacteria, 
to recognize cholera toxins. So if someone has cholera, you can feed them a pelvis lactobacillus, it'll recognize the toxin and neutralize it. Um, so obviously, disease treatments. Um, there's thought about having E. coli producing insulin over like one after um, another, putting in a pill, so people with diabetes don't have to um, inject themselves with insulin. You can use the kill switch to target overgrowing cells, like cancer cells. Um, there's work being done uh, with human cells. I know I said it was difficult, um, but there is some really cool work done where people take out, um, doctors take out people's T cells who have cancer, take them in the lab, reprogram, reprogram them, tell them how to recognize cancer cells, and then put them back into uh, the patient, and then that ends up um, helping their cancer treatment, which is pretty wild. Um, there's light-activated cells, and so um, you could take a pill, and then only when it's dark in your body will it release the chemical. Um, there's obviously a lot to be done for synthetic rubber, for reducing waste, for um, stopping the aging process. Um, I saw on MIT's website that some people are pursuing trying to get human, human cells that photosynthesize, which is really wild. Um, and so on and so forth. Um, and so I know a lot of you guys are computer scientists, and so if you want to get started kind of messing around with these, um, with these systems, what you can do are download uh, two pieces, or one or the other piece, of open source software. The first is the genome compiler, and so if you think about it, um, you know, what do biologists not have? We don't have a, a way to compile all of our information and look for bugs, essentially. And so um, that's really easy, it's really cool. You can drag and drop parts together and see if they work. Um, then there's this other software that I just started using called Clotho. Um, it has a ton of functionality, and you can write a bunch of different apps for it, so that's, that's kind of a cool, a cool intersection between biology and uh, computer science. And so one, one idea that I have is that it would be cool if we could write an app so that people who are making, um, who are constructing, could know about um, situations in which they're possibly creating super bugs. So that would create super flu or super E. coli, that sort of thing. So um, that would be a good preventative measure, because obviously FDA would not want you to be doing that. Um, so obviously you can see this can be used for good and bad. Um, and yeah, that's it. So does anyone have any questions? How do you make sure that you're targeting the like, correct cells and or bacteria? And that it doesn't have like overflow into yeah. something else. It's like, oh shit, like no, it's like the self-destructing bacteria. Now every bacteria cell in my body is gonna be destroyed. I'm gonna die soon. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. So um, you do that for a number, a number of different ways. So those phages I talked about, there are many different kinds. So there are some that are E. coli specific. There are some that are salmonella specific, and so on. Um, as well as um, as far as like directly looking at the DNA itself and cloning in something um, for DNA or excuse me, at the bacteria level, at the cell level, all those genetic codes are completely different. So if you have a string of 20, of 20 base pairs, you, it's highly unlikely that you'll ever find that same string in the same bacteria. <coughs> and so you can, you can engineer a lot, of, a lot of functionality there. Anything else? Um, is there any specific way that you would like to implement this? Yeah, I mean, I have hundreds of ideas. So, um, well, I'm doing um, some cool stuff in my lab right now. My watch, so, a lot of ideas, but as a grad student, I'm supposed to be focusing on my research. Um, and so, one thing that uh, I'm working on in my lab right now is trying to figure out when a certain large chunk of the genome excises. And when it excises, it forms a circle. And so to do that, I'm deciding if I want to put like half of the green protein on one side and half on the other. So then when it forms a circle, you get green um, fluorescence. Or um, there's a number of different ways to do that. Worldwide, what would you say is the coolest thing that's being done with this right now that's like actually working? Yeah, um, honestly, I think this phage thing is incredible. Like this, um, this biofilm issue. Because biofilms are everywhere and there's so much, especially hospital acquired infection, is caused um, by biofilms. And so this is a really incredible thing. The other thing um, I think is really neat is, do you guys know about MRSA infections? So staph infections on the skin, they don't heal. Um, there's another group that's creating a topical phage cream like this. So you can put it over the wound and it'll kill just the salmonella, which is pretty, or sorry, the staph, which is really cool. So you said you're uh, like interested in an app that could detect if you're designing a super bug. Like, yeah. um, what? characteristics of 
the uh, virus would make the superbug? Yeah, that's a great question. So the first, the first thing I have to be honest is that a lot of times you don't know what you're, you know, you don't know what the effects are going to be when you kind of make mutations and that sort of thing. Um, but you can make a lot of predictions. So one thing that could be potentially really dangerous is if you take, um, for instance, bird flu or a ferret flu or a swine flu and engineer the receptors to match the human receptors. So then that can instantly jump to humans and be really infectious. Another thing is if you make certain mutations in certain uh, enzymes and bacteria that can make them more resistant to antibiotics. 